Take charge of your thoughts. Take charge of your life. Psychologist, author, speaker, musician, former professor, and the host of Love and Life, Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Welcome to Love and Life. I'm Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. During my freshman year of college, I fell in love for the first time. And in my sophomore year of college, I had my first massive heartbreak. I remember two things distinctly. One, I remember waking up the day after we broke up and being literally shocked that the sun was still shining. (laughs) I know that sounds crazy, but in my mind, in my experience, this heartbreak was so profound that really the world should not continue to turn on its axis. The second thing that's crystal clear from that time is that all those breakup songs on the radio now had new meaning for me. Before heartbreak, we sing along with the songs and we sing the lyrics and they are catchy songs and We think we maybe have an idea of what the artist is trying to convey. But once we've been through heartbreak, we resonate with the messages. We get it in a way we simply couldn't have understood before being part of the Lucky Heartbreak Club, which is pretty much everyone. I don't think anyone, unless you end up marrying your high school sweetheart, the first person you ever had a relationship with, 99.9% of us experience heartbreak. And it's something that is on the minds and hearts of those in my community. I get a lot of questions about heartbreak. So I wanted to devote an episode just to how to get over a broken heart. I've addressed this topic way back in the beginning of the podcast. Episode 11 is called Bad Breakup. Take charge of the pain. In this episode, I share my all-time worst breakup which was hideous and kicked my butt and left me reeling for years. And I also share an original song I wrote as catharsis to try to work through my pain. I mean, Adele showed us that beauty can come from heartbreak. So yeah, check out that episode if that interests you. Episode 12 also, Breaking Up is Hard to Do. Can we get better at it? And in this episode, I interview British breakup expert, Laura Yates, and we talk about ways to bounce back after heartbreak. And today we're going to delve into it as well. We're going to look at a little bit of science. We're going to look at some realities of being on the dating scene. And then I'm going to share some tangible techniques to help us get through the pain of a broken heart. Let's connect on social. I'm most active on Instagram, where I post original quotes, infographics, and I tackle trending topics in my Love Smarter, Not Harder IGTVs. On Insta, you can find me at Dr. Karen, D-R dot K-A-R-I-N. I'm also on Facebook at Dr. Karen Anderson Abril and on Twitter at Dr. Karen Anderson. A lot of people who have been off the dating scene for a while forget how rough it is. And they say things like, oh my gosh, just get out there and have fun. And they want to grab our phones and swipe through our apps. And they really liken the dating scene nowadays to us being kids in a candy store. And it's just so many tempting and tantalizing options to choose from. And of course, that's not at all how it feels. It feels very demoralizing and discouraging. And all those tantalizing options in reality aren't all that appealing all too often. So my first point about the realities of dating as it relates to heartbreak is one, if you date, you are going to experience pain. There's no way around it. Some of us remain in the dating scene longer and experience more heartbreak Others less, but either way, if you choose to look for love, you will experience pain. You guys know I am a huge optimist, but I also believe it's important to be realistic. 
And those friends of yours who think that dating is just a walk through the park, they don't get it. Of course they don't. And that's okay because that's their experience. So when you're on the dating scene and you know how rough it is, remember, it's supposed to be rough. It's not fun to keep putting yourself out there, to keep taking the risks. And of course, some people decide, I'm done. They shut it down. They're, they tell themselves and everyone else, I've been brokenhearted way too many times. I need to pull back, protect myself. I'm not going to take any risks anymore. And that's a choice, of course. And it's a way to protect yourself from heartbreak. And I get where it comes from. If you've been dating for a long time, and as you guys know, I started dating at 15 and didn't get married until I was 42. So I experienced pretty much every variation of the dating scene. I got my butt kicked and I got my heart broken and I did the same to others. That's what happens. What comes around goes around. All's fair and love and war and all the cliches apply. So I know what it feels like to sometimes think to yourself, it would just be easier to stop trying. I can't have any more hope. I'm over this scene. And sometimes people do that and they pull back. And maybe for a time, that's a good choice to just take yourself off the market for a minute, to lick your wounds, to heal yourself, to work on yourself. That's a perfectly legitimate option for a season. But I submit that most of us, if we take ourselves off the market for forever, we're essentially picking our poison. We want to protect ourselves from pain, but what's going to happen? We're going to have the pain of loneliness and of feeling like we're missing out on a great epic love of that lifelong partnership that most people do desire to have in their life. So the solution to heartbreak is not to completely recoil and say, forget it, because you will not, in fact, protect yourself from pain. You're just going to have a different type of pain, a different type of poison. Your pain will be the loneliness and the wondering if you had taken the risk, if you had given it another chance, would you maybe have truly found love? So point one is to just recognize and have reasonable expectations that inherent to the process of dating, inherent to taking the risk to find true love, there will be pain. There will be. And I say this not to be negative or pessimistic because as I mentioned, I had my fair share and I would do it all over again and I would cry every tear again. And I'm so thankful that I didn't give up and shut down my search for love because eventually I did meet him and it was all worth it. But I think it's important to remember, and Dr. Duana Welch talks about this in her book, Love Factually, and I did an interview with her in episode 92. I highly recommend it for anyone on the dating scene. Such great science-based strategies for approaching dating in a way that makes sense and protects your heart. But she talks about the dating Again, getting back to the notion that, oh, it's just so much fun out there. It's not. It's work, but it's work that's worth it. Like anything in life, anything that's worth having is worth working for. And when it comes to love, a heartbreak or two or 25, these heartbreaks are worth it because the chance of finding your person, of finding true love is worth all those heartbreaks. The second reality of dating that once we embrace helps make things a little bit easier. And it's obvious, but we don't always see it that way when we're in these relationships. But that reality is that every relationship we are in until we meet our person is going to fail. And that failure isn't actually failure because it's getting us closer to our person. Does that mean heartache? Yes. Does that mean pain? Yes. But if we don't move through this relationship with the wrong person, we can't free ourselves up to be with the right person. And this gets so dicey because when we're in a relationship, we are in it because we're excited about this person and we're in love and we're hoping this is our person. So we don't have that clarity until oftentimes Sometimes months or years after the relationship is over, do we finally see, oh yeah, I get why that wasn't the right person. But we have to remember that even though it hurts, 
And it hurts whether we're the one who's walking away or whether someone is walking away from us. But even though it hurts, moving past that relationship gets us one step closer to our person, to the right relationship. The trick, of course, is to not get so jaded and bitter after multiple relationships that haven't worked out. The trick is to not look at yourself as flawed or damaged or, hey, I'm the common denominator in all these failed relationships. So what's wrong with me? And yes, we should be reflective. And yes, we should take a look at the part that we play in any relationship's demise because we want to make sure that we're approaching relationships from an emotionally healthy place, that we are approaching relationships looking to partner with someone as opposed to looking for someone to complete us or fill our emotional voids or heal some psychological wound. So yes, we absolutely need to examine ourselves. But sometimes, and this is what I talk about in my book, sometimes many of us are out there and the reason every relationship we are in isn't working out is because we're in the wrong relationships and there's nothing we can do about it. We're giving it a try with this person. We're giving it a try with that person. And we just haven't met our person yet. So in the midst of all that heartbreak, we have to still stay true to ourselves, still stay hopeful. And I know that's hard, but that's why there's my podcast. There's other voices in this space that are here to encourage and empower and to remind you that, yes, it's hard. But please don't start believing the lies that it's all about you and you're doing something fundamentally wrong and you're fundamentally flawed and that's why it'll never work out for you in relationships. No, the reason it hasn't worked out for you in relationships is because you have yet to find the right fit for you. You have yet to be in the relationship that is meant for you for forever. There's only one forever. So until you meet that person with whom you are going to be forever, the others are going to fail. Again, fail in quotes because they're not really failures because they're leading you to your person. You're one step closer. I've heard it put this way and I love this. Rejection is God's protection. Protecting you from being with the wrong person. So every breakup actually is a win. I know that does not seem very soothing or comforting in the moment when we are in the midst of that valley of pain, but it is. And it took me a long time to believe this because I experienced so many heartbreaks myself. So that's why it's important to remember, to remember that if it's not supposed to work out, we don't want it to work out. We want to move on and move toward our person, the one with whom we will be forever. The third point, the third reality of the dating scene as it relates to heartbreak is it only takes one to be the one. Another, well, obviously concept, but one that I remember, I was in my late 30s, I had called off my wedding, I had had another heartbreak, dated another guy for two years, and then was back on the scene in my late 30s and exhausted. I was exhausted. I was tired of dating. I was over it. But I didn't want to give up on love. So I had to do what we all have to do. I had to put on my big girl pants and get back out there. And I remember somehow, some way, it occurred to me that every first date I was going to go on till the end of my life... <laughs> It was, yes, exhausting. It was, yes, demoralizing. It was, yes, I was tired of it. But on the flip side, every first date that I would go on could possibly be my last first date. And somehow that encouraged me in combination with the notion that, yes, I keep dating all these guys, but I only need one of them to be the one. And to realize that related to the last point, about all these relationships tanking until I meet my person. I don't need to make all those relationships work. I don't need to make it work with every guy. It only takes one to be the one. 
If you're looking for some in-depth support, head over to my website, loveandlifemedia.com and click on the work with me tab to schedule a consultation. Consultations will help you clarify underlying emotional and psychological concerns, will target limiting beliefs and thought patterns, will learn empowering techniques from cognitive therapy to sustainably elevate your mindset and mood, will identify relationship dynamics which are impeding your goals, and will together generate a concrete plan for moving forward to help you thrive in love and life. Schedule your consultation today at loveandlifemedia.com. I'd love to work with you. So now let's look a little bit at the science. And all of us who've been there can attest to the reality that emotional pain is excruciating. And the same areas of your brain that light up when you're in physical pain also light up when you're in emotional pain. Your stress Hormone cortisol elevates, which causes some of us to eat nothing and others to eat everything. MRIs show that we experience withdrawal when we are trying to get over someone. And this withdrawal is not so different from the withdrawal that addicts experience when they try to get off cocaine or opioids. The same neural mechanisms are activated which I think just gives you a little bit of an understanding as to why it's so hard. You're hooked on somebody, and some of the lyricists use that imagery in songs. And I know I've experienced that. I just couldn't. It felt I just couldn't get over this person. And to see that my brain was wired to crave that person the way an addict craves his drug of choice... It helps to know that there are neurological realities at work here. A study by psychologist Art Aaron, neurologist Lucy Brown, and anthropologist Helen Fisher looked at the brains of people who were deeply in love through an MRI. And what they found was that when participants looked at an image of their beloved, their caudate nucleus was flooded with dopamine This area of the brain is related to goal-oriented behavior or what psychologists and neurologists call the reward system. And that dopamine rush through your reward system also occurs should you smoke a cigarette or try cocaine, which is why many researchers consider love to be addictive and those in love to be addicts. So these same researchers wanted to understand how these brain systems function when these love addicts lose their love interest. In another study, the researchers gathered a group of individuals experiencing a recent breakup. The participants indicated that they thought about their ex approximately 85% of the day. They desperately wanted to reunite with their ex And they all reported what the researchers called signs of lack of emotion control, including, quote, inappropriate phoning, writing or emailing, pleading for reconciliation, sobbing for hours, drinking too much and or making dramatic entrances and exits into the rejecter's home, place of work or social space to express anger, despair or passionate love, end quote. They were extraordinarily heartbroken and they were acting in pretty dramatic fashion. So when these participants looked at an image of their ex who had broken up with them and their brains were being observed in the MRI, researchers found the following. One, as far as the reward system is concerned, they're still in love. So yes, the breakup has occurred, but part of the brain (laughs) doesn't get it. Which makes sense, right? Because that's how we feel when a breakup has occurred. We have a hard time truly embracing the reality. It's very similar to the five stages of grief. The first one being denial. We're in shock. We don't even believe it's true. And according to this research, our reward system of the brain doesn't believe it either. So yes, cognitively, yes, your mind knows the truth, but the brain and its reward system is still craving what it wants and looking for its fix. Point two about the brain is that certain portions of the brain try to override the others. And as was the case with these participants, 
the rational part of the brain was struggling because they were behaving in ways that they would very likely regret later. It's like that little angel on the one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder. And we've experienced that. We feel irrational. We feel out of control. That anger, that venom from the devil on the shoulder telling us to do this and go to his house and beat on his door and scream at him. And then the angel's going, please don't do that. I don't think that's a solid plan. I think we might regret that someday. In this case, the orbital frontal cortex, which is responsible for controlling behavior, is trying so hard to keep us level-headed. And even those of us who consider ourselves pretty even keel can have those surges of emotion that make us want to act like a fool. So I share the science and the brain chemistry to help us all understand that when we feel completely out of control, when we feel completely not ourselves during heartbreak, It's legit. We have every reason to feel that. The way that people, when they're high on a drug, aren't acting like themselves either. And continuing on with the analogy that trying to get over an ex isn't so dissimilar from trying to break an addiction. I think that science is comforting because it validates the intensity of heartbreak. It's so great connecting with all of you via the podcast, and I would love to meet you IRL. If your organization is looking for a speaker for your next event, check out my website, go to the speaking page, and see the content that I love to talk about. Just like on the podcast, in my speeches, I cover a wide array of topics grounded in psych research, of course. I'd love to meet you and share strategies for thriving in all realms of love and life with you and your organization. I cannot recommend Dr. Karen enough as your speaker at your event. As my keynote speaker, she completely set the tone of compassion, self-love, and authenticity that bled into everything we did for the rest of the event. She was incredibly prepared and present and went above and beyond when it came to sharing the event with her audience. Her knowledge, magnetic energy, and expertise while on stage is one thing. It will be everything you'd hope for and more for your audience. But her giving spirit and willingness to do more than simply show up when it's time to go on is icing on the cake. She walks her talk, and by the end of working with her, I was wishing she lived down the block from me for weekly meetups. For more information and to book me to speak at your next event, contact my producer, Tim May. Tim at loveandlifemedia.com. And now to what we can do about it. I have three tangible strategies for you. And the first one is to go no contact cold turkey. This, admittedly, is something I was horrible at. I talk about this in my book about not getting back together with your ex because I did it myself too many times. And all it did every time was drag out the pain. Here's how I describe it in my book. I remember something my friend's mom once said when we were in our 20s. We were girl talking over dinner about our inability to get guys out of our system. She leaned in and said, which is more painful to cleanly sever something in one swift slice or slowly lacerate it, tearing away shred after shred with the dullest knife you can find. Sadly, I tended to opt for the latter and I utterly regret it. In fact, If there were one thing I could change about how I handled my 27 years of dating, it would be my unwillingness to make clean breaks. I wish I'd read this chapter before I wrote it, which I understand is impossible, but you get what I mean. I could have saved myself an enormous amount of emotional torment if I'd let no be my final answer, especially when my exes posed the proverbial, can we still be friends? So... Do what I say, not as I did in this case, and the research supports it. All the scientists who are looking at heartbreak and the science of it concur that this is the best approach. Helen Fisher says, quote, throw out the cards and letters or put them in a box and put them in the attic. Don't write, don't call, and don't show up where this person is likely to be. Instead, go out with old friends, get hugs from old friends, 
That drives up the oxytocin system and calms you down, end quote. Your social support network will be critical during this time. Find your friends who can support you, who can be truth tellers, who won't let you obsess and ruminate because obsessing and ruminating over your ex is related to depression. Obsessing and ruminating in general is related to depression. So get those friends who will listen a little bit, validate you, validate your pain, and then say, okay, girl, we got to move on. Because if you have friends that let you wallow, you'll stay stuck. Also, you need friends who will make sure you are not trying to stalk your ex on social media. Don't do it. Please don't do it. If that means you take a social media break, so be it. Love yourself enough to do the hard thing now. Yes, it's harder to go cold turkey. The hard thing now will make it infinitely easier later. Doing the easier thing now will make it harder and harder because you'll keep reinforcing those reward systems in your brain with the dopamine rush. And even though cognitively, you know, you're broken up, your neural activity will not suggest that you're broken up. It's still expecting you to get your fix and it will just take forever to get over your ex. Love yourself enough to do the hard thing now. Number two, heartbreak entails intrusive thoughts. Everything around you will remind you of your ex. If you go to your favorite coffee shop, if you walk by a dog that he had, if you hear a song that was your song, it's impossible to get him or her out of your head. So intrusive thoughts are normal. Obsessing is normal. Sadly, it's normal. And I found when I was trying to get over someone that I had a really hard time taking charge of my thoughts to take charge of my life. But one strategy that was very helpful was to just not trust my own cognitive processes. I couldn't trust my mind to go to a positive place. I would get negative. I would obsess. I'd go over the scenarios. If I'd done this differently, if we'd done this differently, if he'd done this differently, all the questions, why couldn't it have worked out? Why not him? Why isn't he the one? When will it be the one? Blah, 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 blah. My mind was out of control. So what I would do was turn my mind over to positive messaging. Turn my mind over to hope. Put in my mind what my mind couldn't do for itself during that season. My favorite go-to was Joel Osteen. I would listen to sermons over and over and over. I had a stack of CDs that I'd burned from his podcast. This was before cars had Bluetooth, so I would pop those CDs in. If I had to drive 10 minutes, I knew my mind would start going to places of negativity, of obsession, thinking about my ex. So I put the CD in and let Joel provide the hope for me that I currently didn't have on my own. My hope was waning. My faith was struggling. So I let Joel encourage me to help me build back my hope build back my faith, build back my belief that love was for me. It just wasn't for me in this moment and that I would meet my person and that the person I just broke up with just wasn't my person. These are all very obvious things, but when we're in the throes of this addictive neurological state and the heart is broken and the mind feels hijacked by this drug of love that has now been denied us, We struggle and I've been there and I've felt that. So I encourage you to find some motivational speaker, pastor, someone whose messages can give you the hope and the faith that you currently don't have. You don't have to come up with it on your own. You just have to find someone who has hope for you and continue to put these inspiring messages of hope, encouragement, belief in front of your mind. Inundate your mind with positive, hopeful, encouraging, empowering messages. And this will begin the process of rewiring your neural connections. For more on this, take a listen to episode 52. Neuroplasticity is your superpower. Inundating your mind also involves reading quality material. My favorite breakup book of all time is called, It's Called a Breakup Because It's Broken. The Smart Girls Breakup Buddy. 
It's by Greg Barrent, who's also the author of He's Just Not That Into You. He wrote for Sex and the City. He's hilarious and very wise. You get the male perspective, and he also shares when his heart was kicked around and how crazy he acted. So it's a very been there, felt that, but do better than I did kind of book. It's great. I can't recommend it highly enough. And the third strategy is to be very honest. When our heart is aching, it's very easy to put on rose-colored glasses and view the relationship through that lens. We glorify the past. We only remember the highlights of the relationship. We reminisce. We think of the good times and we let the bad times fade away in our mind. And we actually need to do the exact opposite. This will be the one and only time I tell you to think negatively. In this case, think back to all the bad stuff. Write it down. In fact, research substantiates that we will get over a breakup quicker if we force ourselves to think of the bad times. A great exercise is to write down all the bad things. And these can be the dynamics between the two of you or qualities about your ex, because I don't care How great your ex was and how much you've glorified him or her in your mind right now, there were negative traits and there were negative realities that you had to deal with. And when you were in love, you were willing to deal with those things and you were willing to put up with them. But now that you're broken up, this is your opportunity to go, yeah, you know what? I would prefer a more stable life with someone who actually maintains a job all the time or Yeah, I'm not going to miss the fact that he played video games nonstop. I didn't like that. I put up with it. And now I don't have to. Highlight those. I don't have to put up with this mess anymore. Elements of the relationship. When you start reminiscing and feeling wistful, you can remind yourself, yeah, I miss him. But I don't miss the fact that he never had a job. Or when you hear your song and you start feeling down, you can remind yourself that this is a great opportunity to meet someone who doesn't want to play video games 24 hours a day. Write down all the negative realities of the relationship, the dynamics, the activities, the hobbies, the things you were putting up with, the things you don't want to put up with again. Write them all down, his negative qualities, her negative characteristics, because you need to have them in front of your face. Tape them to your bathroom mirror. Remind yourself, do not let yourself idolize him or her and glorify the past. It will keep you stuck and it is not honest. It's not accurate. It's not rational. We want to love smarter, not harder, and we can do it by being mindful of these three very tangible strategies. The love and life hack for this week is breaking up is hideous, but you are stronger than you know. And I hope this episode will help you take charge of even heartbreak by approaching dating with a realistic understanding that it involves pain, but it is worth it. Looking at the science so that we understand what's going on in our brains when we are broken up with. And finally, taking practical steps, doing the hard thing now to make it easier later. Take charge of your thoughts. Take charge of your life. As always, thank you for spending time with me today. It means so much to me. I hope this has been helpful. For more Love Smarter, Not Harder strategies, be sure to check out my IGTVs. I answer your questions there and share with you ideas for how to navigate love and life from an empowered and smart perspective. Also, please join my mailing list at loveandlifemedia.com. I'd love to connect with you via email once or twice a month. Also, a huge thank you to all of you who've taken a moment to review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere. It makes a huge difference. It helps others find the program and join our community and... I just really appreciate it. So thank you so much. And until next time, make it a great week.
Love and Life is produced by Tim May and hosts and executive producer, Dr. Karen Anderson-Abram. <laughs>